I'd like to thank Professor Ulrich Pagal and Jacqueline Hargreaves for the invitation to talk for the Centre of Yoga Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of my book on the Amaralga and Amaralga Praboda, which is the second published critical edition of the Hatha Yoga Project and the third book in the Hatha Yoga series at the IFP and EFEO in Pondicherry. This book is the culmination of more than 20 years of research that I've undertaken on the history of yoga since completing my undergraduate degree in Sanskrit at the University of Sydney. The research became a full-time job when I started my doctorate at the University of Oxford in 2008. I find it hard to believe that it took me so many years to finish a book of just 175 pages. Fortunately, my rate of pay has not depended on the number of words that I've written. Although I've been working on the Amaralga and Amaralga Praboda for so many years, this book is the result of a large group of family, friends and colleagues helping me along the way. I haven't the time to thank everyone now, but I hope all of you read the acknowledgements at the front of the book, because if the book disappoints you, every, everyone mentioned there bears some responsibility for it. In particular, my colleagues on the Hatha Yoga Project, Jim Mallinson, Mark Singleton, and Daniela Bevilacqua, my doctoral supervisor, Alexis Sanderson, the director of the EFEO, Dominic Goodall, and my wife, Jacqueline Hargreaves, who knows that I always avoid responsibility for any mistakes that people might think are mine. The Amaralga and Amaralga Praboda are Sanskrit texts that manuscript colophons attribute to Gurakshanata, one of the supposed founders of the Nata sect and a pioneer of a physical type of yoga called Hatha. The term Amaralga literally means a stream of immortals. In this case, it refers to both the lineage of perfected yogis called Siddhas and the aim of their practice called Raj Yoga, the best of all yogas, which was essentially a profound state of meditative absorption that brought about uh, liberation from samsara. In this talk, I will explain what was known about the Amaralga Praboda before the Hatha Yoga project began in 2015. The research for this project resulted in the discovery of an early recension called the Amaralga, which was likely composed shortly after the Amrita Siddhi, a Buddhist esoteric work on yoga. The Hatha Yoga Project also researched the Amrita Siddhi in detail, and Jim Mallinson and Peter Santo have published an excellent critical edition and translation as an output of the project. My book tries to explain how the yoga of the Amrita Siddhi became the yoga of a fourfold system that aimed to unite Shiva and Shakti, achieve Raj Yoga, and make the yogi an equal to Shiva. I will also talk about the relationship between the Amaralga and the Hatha Pradipika and how this relationship helps us to trace the development of Hatha Yoga from the 12th to the 15th centuries. So an edition of the Amaralga Praboda was published in 1954 by Kalyani Malik in the book uh, that you see on the right there, the Siddha Siddhanta Padati and other works of the Nata Yogis. Her book consists of 10 texts by Matsyendra Nata and his disciples. The manuscript colophon of the uh, Amaralga Praboda that Kalyani Malik transcribes attributes the work to Garaksha Nata which is why she uh, included the book, uh, included the Amaralga Praboda in her book. In the introduction, uh, these are the details that she gives about the manuscript of the Amaralga Praboda that she used. Uh, it mentions the number D4339. This corresponds to a manuscript uh, of the Amaralga Praboda in the Government Oriental Manuscript Library in Chennai. 
I requested to see this manuscript in 2004 when I was collecting manuscripts uh, for my um, first attempt at a critical edition of the Amanaskar. And at the time, I was told that uh, the manuscript was badly damaged and, uh, and it was not uh, accessible to anybody. anybody. Uh, and then since returning to the library, I've been told that uh, D4339 is no longer available. So it's possible that this uh, manuscript has been uh, lost. Um, fortunately, though, we have Kalyani Malik's uh, edition. Uh, here's the first page of her um, edition of the Amaralga Praboda. It the, the verses are numbered and the text contains 75 verses. As you can see, there's no apparatus uh, and she's made a few uh, corrections and emendations um, by citing the original reading in round brackets and then changing it to uh, changing the reading in the text accordingly. However, I've also noted that there are some uh, tacit uh, emendations and corrections and perhaps also some uh, um, mistranscriptions uh, in her um, edition because the first uh, 10 or so and last 10 verses of this manuscript have been tr transcribed in the descriptive catalogue of the Government Oriental Manuscript Library. And there you can see that there are some differences between uh, that transcription and Kalyani Malik's edition. The first serious scholarship that was done on the Amaralga Praboda in terms of trying to, to date and uh, the text and understand it within the wider range of uh, literature on Hatha Yoga was done by Christian Bui in his book on the Yoga Upanishads published in 1994. There he notes that the Amaralga Praboda is the source of 20 or so verses on Hatha Yoga that are in the Hatha Pradipika. Christian Bui um, was able to identify uh, various texts that uh, have similar material to the Hatha Pradipika and therefore he proposed that the Hatha Pradipika was largely an anthology. The Amaralga Praboda was one of those source texts, so he dates the Amaralga Praboda to sometime before the 15th century. Jim Mallinson had also noted that the Amaralga Praboda has a verse in common with the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, that being a, an original text. Um, I noted in my doctoral thesis that the Amaralga Praboda has a verse in common with the Amanaskar. And it's also clear that the Amaralga Praboda is a compilation because it cites a verse um, with attribution to the Sri Samputa. And it mentions another text called the Amaralga Samsidi uh, towards the end of the work and seems to summarize uh, the yoga that's in that text. So the scholarly consensus in 2015 was that the Amaralga Praboda was not one of the earliest Hatha and Raja Yoga texts because it borrows from the Amanaskar and the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, but yet it nonetheless predates the Hatha Pradipika. So this means it was probably written around the 14th century. In our proposal to the European Research Council for the Hatha Yoga project, um, this is why we sort of listed the Amaralga Praboda um, somewhat down the list at number six, thinking that it uh, that the earliest texts on Hatha and Raja Yoga at this time were the Amrita Siddhi, Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, Garaksha Shataka, and so forth. Um, so when the Hatha Yoga um, project started, I went to India to collect more manuscripts uh, of the Amaralga and other texts that we were proposing to edit. And I came across um, uh, another manuscript at the Government Oriental Manuscript Library in Chennai, which you can see here. It's written in Grunta, an older style of Grunta, maybe to the dating to the 18th century. Uh, it's complete and uh, legible. It contains, however, only 46 verses. Uh, and as you can see, there, the colophon, which I've put uh, at the bottom left there, calls the text the Amaralga and attributes it to Goraksha. At the Adyar Library and Research Centre in Chennai, I came across another manuscript of the Amaralga, 
it too contains only 46 verses. And as you can see there in the colophon, calls the text the Amaralga and attributes it to Goraksha. This is also written in Granta, but it's a more uh, modern style of Granta, sort of running, running writing style, which I find a lot more difficult to read, but it probably dates to the late 19th or perhaps even uh, early 20th century. Nonetheless, these two texts are independent witnesses. It's uh, not the case that this more recent manuscript is a copy of the earlier one. They both have um, different uh, uh, mistakes and, and uh, readings. So I, at this stage, had two versions of the Amaralga, one with 46 verses and one with 75 verses called the Amaralga Praboda. So the first uh, thing that I had to do was to compare them to see what the relation between the two uh, texts was. Well, to me, it became quite clear that the structure of the Amaralga was more coherent than that of the Amaralga Praboda. Basically, the Amaralga begins with an introductory section, um, and that introductory section does not contain the verse that is um, attributed to the Sri Samputta, and it doesn't contain the verse borrowed from the Amanaska. It then ends with a verse on the four yogas where, um, where the, the author asks, how can Raja Yoga, which is the main teaching of the text, how can Raja Yoga um, uh, be taught with the other yogas of Mantra, Laya and Hatha? And this, of course, uh, leads to the larger section of the text, which is a discussion on Mantra, Laya, Hatha and Raja Yoga. Um, and then the text ends with a very short conclusion. Well, with the Amaralga Praboda, of course, we get the verse on the Amanaskar and the Sri Samputta in the introductory passage. And then we have the same verse um, um, here, verse 17, as opposed to verse 14 in the Amaralga, that asks how Raja Yoga can be taught with Mantra Laya and Hatha Yoga. But instead of getting the discussion on the four yogas, the Amaralga Praboda has a fairly large passage of about eight uh, or nine verses um, describing the four types of practitioner. So it seems fairly clear that this uh, passage was inserted at a later time. Um, and then towards the end of the text, after the section on Hatha Yoga, the passage on Raja Yoga has been greatly uh, expanded. Uh, in quite a, di a discursive way, uh, there are sections of the uh, of this passage that don't seem to be connected to the rest of the text, such as a practice about uh, retaining the elements within the body to bring about immortality. It's not clear whether that's a technique of Raja, Mantra, Laya or Hatha Yoga. Uh, and it's there that we also get the verse that's been borrowed from the Dattatre Yoga Shastra, as well as the reference to the Amaralga Samsidhi. So it's a little, it's quite discursive and certainly not as uh, concise and cohesive as the end of the Amaralga. So I concluded that the Amaralga was the earlier work that was an original composition, uh, whereas the Amaralga Praboda was, was a later redaction that had drawn material from other sources. And so this, uh, enabled me to um, make a close connection, if you like, between the Amaralga and the Amaralga Samsidhi, because both texts teach the same three mudras, the same four stages of yoga, which involve piercing of uh, three, the same three knots going up through the central channel, and then the arising of various sounds, blisses and voids as the practitioner moves through the four stages of yoga. So these are both in the Amaralga and the Amrita Siddhi. Um, the Amaralga calls this practice of the three mudras in four stages Hatha, and there it's one of four yogas, as I've mentioned, Mantra, Laya, Hatha, the first three being um, auxiliary practices, if you like, that are, that are supposed to achieve Raja Yoga, the fourth yoga. Whereas in the Amrita Siddhi, the practice of the three mudras in four stages is just the yoga practice that the text teaches. The four yogas in the Amaralga are absent. 
The Amar Olga contains Shaiva concepts such as Kundalini uniting Shiva and Shakti at the Brahmarandra, the aperture of Brahma at the top of the head, dissolving the universe into the Linga. It's, it's undoubtedly written for a Shaiva audience. Uh, and of course, this is, uh, stands in contrast to the Amrita Siddhi, which was composed for an esoteric Buddhist audience, does not contain the Shaiva concepts. Um, and so it's quite clear that this practice of the three mudras and four stages of yoga uh, is the same in both works, but in the Amaralga, it's been adapted and repurposed for a Shaiva audience. And more generally, I would say the Amrita Siddhi emphasizes the raising of bindu, that's generative fluid within the yogin's body, um, moving it up through the central channel to replenish the moon in the head, which thereby brings about immortality. Whereas uh, this um, process is not uh, discussed much, it is mentioned in, in the introduction of the Amaralga, the fact that um, uh, bindu and nada are, are two great uh, medicines with um, for the yogi, but there it says, um, uh, even having known that much, one needs a guru uh, in order to achieve immortality. So, also in this in the section on um, Hatha Yoga in the Amaralga, Bindu is not mentioned at all. Perhaps the reason for this goes back to a verse in the introduction, which says that Hatha Yoga is uh, twofold because its practice may depend on either Nada the resonance within the body or generative fluid. And so it would seem that the Amaralga is teaching the version of Hatha Yoga at that time that focused more on the practice of um, generating different internal resonances within the body. And this is consistent with the definition of Hatha Yoga, perhaps the one of the earliest definitions that we have, it says that uh, this type of yoga is accomplished by the breath and internal resonance, um, Bindu not being mentioned. Uh, but nonetheless, the Amrita Siddhi and the Amaralga um, were probably composed in this at the same time in the same place or cl perhaps within the same region of India, which is uh, northern Kerala, modern day Mangalore, where a particular Siddha mentioned at the beginning of the Amaralga, um, Siddha Buddha was said to have uh, was said to have lived. And of course, the Amrita Siddhi is a work um, uh, attributed to the Siddha Virupaksha, who was also known to have uh, um, resided in that area. And this is, of course, quite important for locating the, um, I suppose, the social history around these two texts, that being that we see Buddhist communities um, starting to convert en masse to, um, to, uh, to Shaivism. And that perhaps explains how this yoga of the Amrita city was um, uh, borrowed and uh, repurposed for a Shaiva audience in the Amaralga. So looking at the Amaralga and some of the salient features of that text, we can start to trace how other Hatha and Raja Yoga texts composed after it, um, uh, in a sense borrowed, but also reformulated some of its teachings. And of course, all these texts that you see here were source works for the, for the Hatha Pradipika, which we believe was composed in the 15th century. So the experimentation and development that we see during this time was occurring between the 12th and the 15th century. So if we look at these one by one, the Yoga Bija, for example, teaches the same four yogas, Mantra, Laya, Hatha, and Raja Yoga. And it also teaches a practice of Shakti Chalana that has some similarities with that of the Yamaralga, such as moving um, prana up through the central channel to pierce uh, the three knots. This practice of Shakti Chalana is also similar to that mentioned in the Garaksha Shataka, where the same three knots are, are pierced. Um, but the Garaksha Shataka does not teach the four yogas, which is why I've placed it in square brackets uh, there. Uh, there's also some similarities between the Amaralga and Yoga Taravali. The Yoga Taravali has this Hatha Raja Yoga format, and it teaches a very simple practice of applying three internal locks 
they are the root lock, Mulabanda, the chin lock, uh, either called Kantabanda or Jalandhara Bandha, and Uddiyana Bandha during a breath retention. Well, the Amarauga teaches two of those uh, Bandhas, uh, Mula Bandha and the Chin Lok, um, as part of its practice of the three mudras. So the, it seems the Yoga Taravali, perhaps the innovation there, was the introduction of the third Lok, the third Bandha Uddiyana. And we also see the same four yogas being taught in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, um, Mantra, Laya, Hatha and Raj Yoga. And the same mudras, Mahamudra, Mahabandha, and Mahaveda are also taught in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. This work is a syncretic uh, text that's bringing in more practices. It has a collection of 10 mudras instead of the three that we find in the Amarauga. And in that regard, it's also similar to the Viveka Martanda, which has a collection of six mudras, one of those being the same as the Amarauga, that is uh, Mahamudra. The Viveka Martanda, however, does not teach the four yogas, which is why I've put it in square brackets there. So all of these texts contributed to the Hatha Pradipika, so we can sort of see how teachings and ideas within the Amarauga were you know, changed over time. Uh, an, uh, an interesting ex example of that is in the Yoga Bija, where the same four yogas are taught, but they're taught in a in a sort of a sequential manner where the practitioner starts by practicing mantra laya, then progresses to hatha, then progresses to laya yoga, dissolution of the mind, and then finally achieves raja yoga. Well, in the Amarauga, uh, a sequence of these four yogas is not taught, but it seems to relate more to the four types of student as we see in the uh, Amarauga Prabodha and the Shiva Samhita where mantra yoga was was supposed to be given to students of little capacity and low intellect. Um, more capable students were given laya yoga. And again, more capable students, uh, hatha yoga and exceptional students were given raja yoga. The implication of that being that exceptional students could skip mantra, laya and hatha if they could uh, um, practice raja yoga without the help of, uh, of an auxiliary practice. Um, so yes, yeah, so these, even though these concepts may derive or go back to the Amarauga, they certainly changed um, in the centuries that followed it. And this is uh, very true of the Hatha Pradipika, where teachings from those earlier texts were brought together in a new format, um, that being uh, one of four auxiliaries, the first being asana, the second pranayama, if you like, which in the second chapter consists of the practice of six um, therapeutic techniques that are designed to um, enable a yogin who's suffering from excess fem or flat fat to then practice the kumbhakas, the eight kumbhakas that are taught in that chapter. And then the third chapter of the Hatha Pradipika was on mudras, the first three of these being those taught in the Amaralga, and then it adds seven more mudras uh, to those three, these seven also appearing uh, in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. Uh, and then the final chapter is on Raja Yoga, and this consists uh, of the practice of Shambhavi Mudra, but also that of Nadano Sandana which uh, is uh, sort of focusing the mind on the internal resonance that arises in the body after the practice of yoga. And it's there that we see um, the Amaralga's discussion of the four stages of yoga with the piercing of the three knots and the different sounds, blisses and voids arising. We see that in the fourth chapter of the Hatha Pradipika. And then it's followed by another account, obviously from a different source of Nadana Sandana in a tradition where a sort of sequence of 10 sounds uh, were supposed to arise. So through the lens of the Hatha Pradipika, we see that the Amaralga's Hatha Yoga was basically the practice of the three mudras plus Nadana Sandana. And in coming up with this fourfold system, Svatmarama split um, the practice of the three mudras from Nadana Sandana um, the first occurring in the third chapter and the second in the fourth chapter.
So what are the differences that we see? Well, the four yogas of the Amarauga are, drop, are dropped. Um, the Hatha Pradipika doesn't teach mantra or lie yoga. It does take some um, ideas in other texts uh, on lie yoga and integrates them into the fourth chapter as Raja Yoga, but it doesn't mention lie yoga as a separate uh, type of yoga as we see in the Amarauga. In the Hatha Pradipika, um, Hatha is foregrounded as the sole means to Raja Yoga. So rather than this system of four types of student where you know the, the student would practice one of the first three types of yoga to achieve Raja Yoga, in the Hatha Pradipika, Hatha Yoga is one size that fits all. All students really have to start um, with Hatha Yoga and then they it's through that practice that they can achieve Raja Yoga. And we see statements to that effect in the Hatha Pradipika, where, for example, it said that uh, without um, Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga cannot be achieved. And without Raja Yoga, Hatha Yoga is pointless. And as I mentioned before, the Hatha Yoga of the Hatha Pradipika has four auxiliaries, um, whereas in the Amarauga, it just consists of the practice of the three mudras and the four stages of yoga. And in the Hatha Pradipika, uh, the practice of Hatha Yoga is greatly expanded by the addition of new uh, techniques, the eight kumbhakas, for example, the Shat Karma and the other mudras. So even though Hatha Yoga is the only auxiliary practice in the Hatha Pradipika that, uh, that's taught for achieving Raja Yoga, its practice is greatly expanded, and perhaps that's how it was able to accommodate, um, you know, a, a, a wide range of, of people with different capabilities. Whereas in the Amarauga, people of different capabilities were um, accommodated, if you like, by having three types of yoga. So if we compare the Amarauga with the Hatha Pradipika, we can also see how the practice of the three mudras changed over time. So in the Amarauga, the first mudra, Maha Mudra, is practiced in the position that you can see here with one leg straight, the other leg bent at the knee, and the heel of that uh, uh, leg is pressing against the perineum. The yogi then leans forward, holds the foot, the foot of the extended leg, uh, breathes in and then applies the chin lock during breath retention. That's the practice of Mahamudra. And then in the Amarauga, the practice of Mahabandha, the second mudra, is done in the same position. The yogi doesn't move um, the body, uh, but the difference is that when he breathes in through the mouth, uh, holds the breath, instead of applying just the chin lock, as was done in Mahamudra, in Mahabandha, uh, the chin and root lock, mulabandha, are applied together. Um, so the, maha, the difference between uh, Mahabandha and Mahamudra is that Mahabandha also incorporates the practice of the root lock. Um, however, in the Hatha Pradipika, with the practice of Mahabandha, the yogi changes um, the position of the body so that he is in a cross-legged um, position with the heel still pressing against the perineum and then breathes in and of course by this stage we have all three um, bandhas uh, being taught during kumbhaka breath retention so he then breathes in holds a breath applies chin lock root lock and uddiyana uh, for mahabandha then mahaveda is the third of the mudras in the amarauga and this is done um, in a position where the arms and the legs are uh, symmetrical. So he would, uh, the yogi would bend um, the, the straight leg in, that was in Mahabandha and Mahamudra, place the soles of the feet together. And then according to the Amrita Siddhi, the feet are turned down. Um, the yogi lifts the hips onto the heels, places the hands on the ground in front, and then lift, takes a breath in, applies the chin lock, and then lifts the hips up and down so that the um, uh, perineum strikes against the heels. In the Amarauga, the practice is not so cl uh, clearly described, and it is possible 
and this is what I speculate in the book, that it was still done in a seated position, but with the heels together, the, 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 the knees wide, and sort of lifting the body from that position and striking the perineum against the heels. However, in the Hatha Pradipika, um, the cross-legged position that was assumed for um, Mahabandha is retained, and it's in this position that the yogi places the hands on the ground, lifts the hips, and then strikes the buttocks on the ground, as well as the perineum against the heel. So to show you how this practice might have been done in the Amaralga, in a sort of a sequ sequential way, uh, where one mudra follows the other, and there, there's a verse in both the Amaralga and the Hatha Pradipika that says the three mudras should be practiced together. Um, I've made a video for you. So this is the practice of Mahamudra, holding the foot, breathing in through the mouth, text explicitly says through the mouth, applying the chin lock, heel of the bent leg pressing against the perineum, and then exhaling through the nose. So that was Mahamudra. And then the same position is retained, breathing in through the mouth. Now for Mahabandha, chin lock. And then as you can see with my abdomen there, applying the root lock during the retention. and then exhaling through the nose. And then bringing the feet together, and here I'm doing it in a seated position, though it could also perhaps have been done in a squatting position. I would breathe in, chin lock, and then I start to tap the perineum against the heel. So this is Mahaveda, and it's supposed to push the prana up through the central channel so that it pierces the grunties, the knots that block the central channel. And then moving to the second side, extending the other leg, keeping the heel, the bent leg against the perineum, breathing in through the mouth, and just applying the chin lock. Breathing out through the nose. And then breathing in through the mouth. This is for Mahabandha. Chin lock. And then root lock, which is gripping the anus while the breath is held. The text doesn't tell us how long the breath uh, was supposed to be held for. I'm just... Uh, improvising there. Okay, and then Mahaveda. Taking a breath in. Chin lock and tapping the perineum against the heels. Again, the text doesn't say how many uh, times this the, the heels are tapped against the perineum. Here I'm just doing it for as long as I can hold the breath. And then that is the end of one round. And as the text says it was supposed to be done eight times, three times, um, or eight, eight times at the uh, junctures of the day. That would have been sunrise, midday, sunset, and midnight. Okay, so the now moving to the Hatha Pradipika. Maha Mudra, the first of these was done the same way. So breathing in through the mouth. In the early manuscripts of the Hatha Pradipika retain that reading. Later ones are written out the fact that you're supposed to breathe in through the mouth. And you apply the chin lock. And then exhale through the nose. And then for Mahabandha, one moves to a cross-legged position, keeping the heel of, of the lower leg against the perineum, and then breathing in through the mouth. And then chin lock, root lock, Uddiyana, all three bandhas being applied. And then exhaling through the nose. 
And then in the Hatha Pradipika, Mahaveda, the great piercing is also done in this cross-legged position. The hands are placed by the side of the body. Breathe in, chin lock, and then tapping the buttocks against the ground and the perineum against the heel of the lower foot. And then exhaling and moving to the second side, extending the other leg, holding the foot, breathing in through the mouth and chin lock, Mahamudra. Exhaling through the nose and moving to the cross-legged position. It's a sort of half lotus. The foot of the um, left leg is supposed to rest on the opposite thigh. Breathing in through the mouth, chin lock, root lock, uddiyana, all three bandhas. Exhaling through the nose. And then Mahaveda, the great piercing, breathing in and chin lock and tapping the buttocks against the floor and the perineum against the heel. And so that's the practice of the three mudras in the Hatha Pradipika. Okay. So in conclusion, the Amaraga codified an early system of four yogas that feature Hatha and Raja Yoga, designed to cater for students with different cap capabilities. This system created a basic paradigm for integrating physical and meditative practices that endured into the modern period. The text gives us a glimpse of a sequential sequence of practice that combined breath retentions with internal muscular locks and dynamic squatting-like movements. This practice gave rise to a series of internal sounds, blisses, and meditative voids that guided the yogi's progress to Raja Yoga, which according to the text was a state free from mental activity that enabled the yogi to dissolve the entire universe into the linga. This Shaiva interpretation of samadhi was the goal of a physical yoga practice that had been borrowed from esoteric Buddhism and repurposed. In this system, Hatha Yoga was not only subordinate to Raja Yoga, but it was merely one of three options, the other two being mantra and laya yoga. And it was superfluous for the exceptional practitioner who was capable of attaining Raja Yoga without an auxiliary practice. Svatmarama, the author of the Hatha Pradipika, reconfigured the relationship between Hatha and Raja Yoga. He foregrounded Hatha by extending the repertoire of physical practices, by adding diverse asanas, the Shatkama and eight Kumbhakas, and dispensing with mantra and laya yoga. Svatmarama thereby proposed that Hatha was the sole means to Raja Yoga, and his Pradipika on Hatha shone its light mainly on the path rather than the goal. Until recently, the Amaralga has remained buried in the foundations of that path. And I hope you enjoy my account of the excavations that have attempted to answer some of the fundamental questions about the history of physical yoga. Thank you very much.